The Houston Cougars are 1-0, but after reviewing the tape, we've got some more places to grow. Let's jump into it. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Cougs, a daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I am your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews. Hit a breakdown, all things Cougs. If you're a UH fan or just a hater who came stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below so that when you lace on Cougs in your news feed each and every day, we appreciate you making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. And if you're on the YouTube channel where you found us today, welcome back, and it's good to see you again. Remember, we are over 1,500 subscribers, so yay. Ross Osa, come cutting your hat. But B... At 1750, you'll be giving away another big prize. And if we get to 2000 for the TCU game, someone gets a Houston Cougar jersey with the Big 12 logo on it as a welcome to the Big 12 kind of thing. So hit subscribe to make sure we get there. Be commenting and liking the videos to let us know you are in the contests. And if, after talking about week one, you are ready to put that behind you, tell us in the comments down below if you are a crunchy peanut butter, creamy peanut butter, or I guess it's 2023 and I need to offer things like almonds, butter, and sun butter, and so on. Tell us what you put on your pb and All right, so I said yesterday that I was going to keep diving into this, and I watched a little more tape, did a little more analytical study, and I've got some things I think the offense can get better at. Um, we should talk about that in the first segment. And the second segment, I think we need to talk some about the defense, because I think the biggest thing to take from the defense, as I alluded to at the end of yesterday's episode, was they really struggled in replacing certain uh, guys and um, and that really shifted things. We'll talk about that in the second segment. And in the final segment, I come to talk about week one in college football as a whole um, to maybe hopefully make us realize how, uh, you know, it's almost fortunate, it feels weird to say, that Houston is 1-0 and and not 0-1. Uh, but first, let's jump into looking at the offense and where it gets better. And I'm going to start with and talk a lot about Number one, Donovan Smith. Now, I understand that, um, there, I th- and I believe that there are some people online being a little too critical of Donovan Smith uh, in the offense. Um, I, I hope this doesn't come off at any point like that. I overwhelmingly was feeling positive about the direction of the team after the game on Saturday. Um, but he, in his own admission in the post game, has room to grow. And I, I'd like to look at kind of what those things look like because as I look at him, <laughs> His numbers continue to get better from a statistical standpoint the more you look at them. He finished against 64% completion, but in more traditional no-play-action dropback kind of passes, he completed over 71% of his balls. That's a really, really high number. Um, Good for, like, you know, if you threw 71% completions in general, you'd call that guy elite, first-round pick, all of those kinds of things, right? So I wonder, in looking at that, if... We focus, you and I, and uh, maybe even other defenses, so much on the other things he does that make him unique as a dual threat quarterback, right? Do we focus too much on those things and not enough on like, hey, if we just called a more traditional offense, statistically, how does that go for him? Again, in just traditional dropbacks, he was uh, 15 of 21 uh, for 141 yards. Um, that noticeably stands out when looking at other kind of pass patterns. So in play action, he was 7 of 13. In screen balls, he was 2 of 3, or like short, like in the line of scrimmage stuff. Actually, I think some of them were just like RPO spit outs, but you got me. Um, and then in non-screen type of stuff, um, so like when he's not like pumping the ball short, he ended up being 64% overall, and he finished at 64.7 overall. Um I say that to say that we know what Dana's pass game looks like in a more traditional sense, and I wonder if it might benefit Houston to run more of those kinds of concepts. Um, We've seen Houston do well with different mesh route and crossing concepts, kind of rub stuff and rub defensive backs off of one another. Um, I think those are fairly simple for a quarterback new to a system to learn. I think Donovan can handle more complex stuff, but he is new to Houston, right? We've got to remember that as we do this. Um, And so I wonder if that's maybe the direction to go. Um, I also think it's worth looking at like where exactly he found his most comfortable spots on the field, because I like to, I, to this point, have 
thought of him as a sideline to sideline kind of thrower. He put the ball really powerfully outside in the stuff I watched from at Texas Tech. Um, but I have to say that he actually did a really good job just in the short, right, right over the middle, like just inside or just beyond the tackle box region. Um, he got over 83 yards. He got 83. I was about to say over 80. I think I stuck on it. He got 83 yards through the air in just that region alone. Some of that is he gets the ball into Man Jack, and Man Jack then runs with it. He gets the ball to Sam Brown, and Sam Brown then runs with it, and then adds the yardage total when he completes those in that area. But he was, also, he was also 10 of 11 in that window. And admittedly, coming into the game, that would have been the window I probably would have avoided. So that's my own mistake and my analysis because I think of him as, you know, when Houston played him a year ago, and that's my first impression of the guy, as a guy that throws the ball away a lot. And that's when there's a lot of traffic in that middle short distance. And I would have thought that that'd be a, a place that he had problems. And he did not have problems there. <laughs> so maybe we need to put the ball there more. Um, that is to say that maybe those traditional mesh patterns that Dana Holgerson would have run in his first time at Houston or his time at Oklahoma State or his time at West Virginia, right? Um, those kinds of offense patterns may actually favor his arm talent more than we're giving credit for. Now, if you're breaking the, uh, the field down to short, medium, long kind of distances, he was actually, by percentage, best in the intermediate range, the 10 to 25-ish yard range. He was 5 of 6. Um, they threw most of their passes inside of 10 yards. The ball travel, I should say, inside of 10 yards. And he threw 74% completions in that window. He was 33% over the deep route kind of stuff. And I thought it was interesting, and I thought some of his deep balls are almost impressive, it it, because he launched the ball so, so deep that I wonder if there's some way with film study for he and Birch and whomever, uh, Dana, to kind of get on the same page as far as like when to just let those things rip um, because it almost looked like there were times where he did that almost instead of, instead of throwing the ball away, he's like, I'm going to just huck this thing and see if anybody gets down there under it. Now, I don't mean to scoot all the offense onto Donovan. Um, I will say, that though, that in breaking down the film a little bit more, uh, you know, he took sacks when he didn't want to turn the ball over, and I think that's a mature, like a mature thing for him to do. And uh, excuse me, the observation there I think needs to be that honestly, that's a mature thing for any quarterback to do, let alone a guy in his first year in a new system. Um, but we'll see him all year long. The thing I think that we should see differently all year long is the offensive line, and I'm one of the you know. Of the people that talk about Houston football on all your podcasts and social media spheres and so on, I think I was probably the most positive about the offensive line coming in. I, I, Patrick Paul's a pro. I think Freeman's got a shot. I think if Una Jay's healthy, he's got a shot. That's tackle, center, tackle. That's three out of five. I thought the fact that they brought back all guys that are fifth year or sixth year football players, um, I think that was you know a key key you know guy that's good for Houston. That's good for Houston in the sense that like has a lot of depth and talent. Um, and bluntly, in terms of running the football, on a second watch and watching the film, the interior didn't get it done. And I don't mean to say that they can't get it done. I think I'm positive and and I'm, I'm hopeful about the way that this thing projects. And I think a week of film study after watching them play against someone new, I think Nugavi is somebody I have faith in, and he'll get it fixed. But the fold plays. When I say fold plays, I mean like the inside pulls. So like center and guard block down the left and then left guard circles around as a, you know, folding around them to lead through and those kinds of things hitting into your gaps. Houston had success as the game wore on because they kind of wore UTSA out. The weather may have helped in that too. Uh, and Tony Mance has a couple of long runs in the second half that I think exemplify that. Stacy Sneed had a long run in the second half that started on the inside and exemplifies that. But on the whole, in terms of just like actually pounding the ball up the gut, if I were grading Houston's interior offensive line out, they had a rough day in the office. And I think the, the painful thing there is there's a lot of starts under each of those guys' belts. And admittedly, in previous iterations of this offense, they were passed by a lot more, and that's what they're very, very good at. But they've got to move guys off the ball. I understand that UTSA lines up with some guys that are legitimately 340 pounds at their defensive tackle spots. That's not your typical group of five defensive linemen. I don't mean to say that they are. They're a very good football team. But – you're going to see guys at 340 pounds all over the Big 12 Conference. The University of Texas goes like 12 deep on the defensive line, right? We need to beat them at our place, and the one time we get to play them in the Big 12, and they're going to have those same kinds of guys, right? That was a great litmus test, a great set of film to study for them, and I hope they can build on it. But as a whole, those interior fold plays, like if you have trouble with a double team on 1340, 
then you're polar has trouble getting around. And if you're polar has trouble getting around, that means by the time the running back's at the line of scrimmage, there's nowhere for him to go because the polar's still in the hole. And all kinds of things get thrown off if you're not driving those big 340-pound bodies off the ball. Right Now, the inverse of this is Houston had their own injuries that kind of led to, honestly, having some issues there. And I want to talk about that in the second segment. But first, I want to make sure we talk about our buddies at Bird Dogs as I tip my cap to Bird Dogs. Now, Bird Dogs feel good and make you look good. Trust me, they look good when you are sitting down to do a podcast, when you're up in front of a classroom. Again, remember, teacher and coach. They look good when you're at a uh, at a bar on a date they look good frankly with your shirt tucked in on at a country club like they look good in all situ- okay i'm not a country club guy i admit that's me guessing but you feel me on that right um, bird dogs are stretchy khaki material designed to fit slimmer to the thigh and leg giving you a more sculpted look but they still feel flexible because of the materials that they use the shorts are the exact same thing but fit way better than lululemon trust me on that um they fit great as far as like the fit through the thigh and butt. They have elastic waistbands. Bird Dog fixed issues in all kinds of things that like, you might get in traditional khaki shorts by inventing a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki but stretches like athletic shorts. Bird Dog uses anti stink sweat uh, wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Bird Dogs are functional for any occasion. Again, dates teaching in front of the classroom or wearing to work, staying into a podcast, going to the gym, in the pool. It's still out of sight. You're probably still at the pool, etc. So make sure that you go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college. In a promo code locked on college for free. Bird Dogs cap here uh, like I got. Uh, they're also giving away different things every so often. So make sure you check out and order frequently and often to see what the latest gifts are. Birddogs.com slash locked on college. Trust me, you don't want to regret it. Uh, Birddogs.com slash locked on college. All right. So I said I want to talk about the defense because they were missing something very, very key. Much like Houston had trouble on their interior offensive line and moving those big D tackles down. In the first quarter, UJ had trouble moving Houston's defensive tackles around. Uh, Don Nwankwo, a very, very talented nose tackle that if you listen to the show for a while, you know I am a big-time fan of, right? Um, when I look at what Houston was able to do on defense, um, basically until he got hurt, he was extremely, extremely important to what they were doing. Don Nwankwo plays no tackle. Um, with Frank Harris's little bit of limited mobility. Houston was having success getting after him, but doing what we call a crush rush. Now, I said this each day, but if you've not figured out what that means yet or have not been paying attention, or you're new to the show, first of all, welcome if you're new. Um, what that means is the defensive end, the outside rushers, have free reign to do traditional pass rush sets. Interior guys, either d line or linebackers, don't go more than a couple yards past line of scrimmage and kind of play sideline, sideline from there, and thus you're cr- crushing or collapsing the pocket. Nwanko is incredibly talented at this because he's so athletic and quick for a guy at 295 that while he's undersized for a nose tackle, those interior linemen don't have any way to handle him in that short little window when he's like just being elusive and strong. Um, now, in the time he played, he stopped the ball a lot um, as far as like, he might not have been making the play, but he took away gaps on the interior. Once he left the ball game, you'll notice that his fellow defensive tackles, uh, if we were scoring this football game, his fellow defensive tackles scored much, much worse. Um, And that's not to say that they're not good football players, but Jamari Caldwell and Cedric Williams, uh, so pro pro football focus does put numbers on it. They put the numbers based on right place, right percentage of the time that you're in the right place, uh, right time, doing the right thing. Uh, Dot Wonko had one of the higher scores in the football team uh, up in the 70s. Passing grades, and this are typically more like in the low 60s, and his replacements, not natural nose tackles, but Jamari Caldwell and Cedric Williams, who typically play the three technique while Dot's playing the nose, those guys were scoring more like in the mid 50s. Now, again, they were asked to do something and shift over into the interior spot. They're not necessarily the most comfortable playing because Dot is always there. Um, but on the whole, they did not have the same kind of success. And what's funny, if you watch like their play, if you grade them out play by play, right? There are some plays, they're incredible. There are some plays that they're in the right place, right turn, the right thing. Like, and it looks like, oh, they can do this every single snap. They can beat all. I mean, 
uh, UTSA had four of the five offensive linemen returning. They're very veteran up front, and Houston was handling them like multiple plays in a row. And then suddenly, they just boom, and they're out of spots. Uh, UTSA rushed up the gut and gets a you know rips off a twenty five yard run up the a gaps because they blocked down on the no, on the nose tackle or blocked down the defense tackle and wrapped around the guard for what we call the same kind of fold play up the gut. And while it's a very common play in college football, it was hard for Houston to stop without Dot and Wonko in the football game. Now, it did not seem like, um, you know, we had much information on his ankle at the time of the game and time of the injury. He did have trouble getting off the field, even if it's the kind of ankle injury where he were playing, right? Um, Houston's going to have to find some solution for that because, Lyman need blows. I know Dot Nwanko is a crazy good athlete and may not need the same kind of blow that other guys do, but Houston needs to, you know, the troubling thing what there was, you know, assuming Dot Nwanko is, you know, going to be healthy at some point. It's not a super de- crazy injury that, you know, derails everything all the time. Um, the, the painful th- part of this is that truthfully, Houston's going to need someone else that can play nose tackle. Right. Um, now, is that uh, do they move on um, Polisi Lange Jr.? Uh, he's a you know he's a giant as far as his height. He's kind of a little bit leaner at three ten. He's six six three ten. Um, they move him around a little bit. Uh, I thought it was interesting that um, they at some point played when they started putting Jamari and um, Cedric inside of the nose tackle. They started putting like uh, Nelson Caesar or Brandon Mack in the three technique, kind of like you know put some like beefier defensive ends in that three technique spot. Um, but whatever, whatever the solution is, they've got to find some way to plug up the nose as they keep it moving because they can't be that vulnerable up the middle. They just, they, they are going to play as veteran as UTSA is. They're going to play teams that are better than that between the tackles. And I don't know that they'll play, They'll play guys like that where they can game, you know, game plan. They'll have time to game plan, I should say, what they're doing without Dot. But the solution can't just be we're just going to live with every so often giving up a 20-yard run up the gut. Um, Now, I will say that on the whole, it felt like Houston was okay with UTSA running the football. And I think what's interesting there is it's a very modern college football thought. But Houston spent a lot of the second half up by 10 points. And it felt like there was almost this, you know, run the clock out mentality. Let's get out of here. If they want to, if they want to chip away at three yards of carry, four yards of carry, then we'll be okay. The issue with that becomes when those carries turn into 20 yards, right? Um, as far as ways to schematically get past this, and this is where I'll leave it. Although people, people can criticize me if you use the word schematically a lot. Um, how else would you rephrase to making a scheme adjustment? Anyway, um, schematically to fix this. I think it's interesting as you start plugging with linebackers, you saw uh, Malik Robinson do a lot of plugging. I thought the most impactful hit though was actually AJ Halsey filling down from the free safety position. Um, and what I didn't realize until I watched the tape second time is on the play I'm thinking of in the second half, uh, no dot and Wonko, their inside run play. They get like five or six yards. So probably more than you want them to, but um AJ Halsey comes down from the free safety and just takes the running back's legs out. Poof, right? Dive bombs it. And I don't think I think it was just a sign that gap. I don't think he was like blitz or anything like that. Because in the pre-snap, like if you just watch the play first time live, it's like, oh man, that's a good hit. But in the pre-snap, when you know it's coming, you're know, re-watching the film, he starts to play it like 15 yards deep, right? That's just his gap. He's not assigned to come down and blitz or whatever. The only reason that play went for six yards was because AJ's playing at 15 yards. I wonder if that's going to be the fix because he is a good tackler, folks. AJ Halsey, good tackler. If that's the fix and you're going to find some way to cover that up with linebackers and safeties, when it's the free safety, I wonder, do you need to get him down inside like more like 10 or 11 yards instead of more like 15? Not so that he blitzes necessarily, but if he went from 15 and met the running back at six, can we start the play more like 11 and meet the running back at three or two, right? Um, I I think A.J. Halsey's built for that, and if that's the route they want to go, Doug Belk will certainly go that way, but Halsey's the kind of safety thing come down and play that way, and I think it'll be interesting to see if that's the way they want to go. Now, 
Houston had a successful week one in the sense that they won. And I don't mean to say that they didn't. Frankly, as I'm sitting here talking about the defense, they held a defense, they held an offense, I should say, that scored over 36 points per game last year. And Jeff Trailer is a very good offensive coach, theoretically, to just 14 points and turned them over three different times. Um, and so I don't I don't want to belabor that too much because in the third segment, I'm going to talk about how weird college football can be and how weird it really was. But first, we got to talk about our buddies at FanDuel because FanDuel is going to get you ready for the NFL season with incredible offers. America's number one sportsbook is FanDuel, and right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV, which after last weekend's debacle with Spectrum, I believe we are switching to. Now it is the best time to join FanDuel because the app is easy to use and you can bet on everything from the spreads to player props and more. They've got the Houston Texans as 10-point dogs. I've been saying that I'm not saying to bet them straight away, but 10 points seems like a lot for a team with Tank Dell on it. So I'm saying to go to FanDuel.com. Use uh, fanduel.com slash locked on college and kick the NFL season off with an offer you and don't want to miss. Make sure you put something down with those Houston Texans. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right. So, across college football, I think it's worth pointing out that, like, I think people are way too down about the results and being like, oh, the offense only scored 17 points. Oh, you know, UTSA quarterback didn't look right and we we you know da, 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 all those kind of, people are finding ways to be upset about things people are upset about the uniforms i don't understand how you'd be upset about like a nationally understood positive you know again college football game day um on espn the what's the one fox big noon kickoff across the nation everyone recognized that was a positive move so this is my total tangent but how how are you upset about that? A single game alternate uniform that the entire country loves and recruits are falling in love with. How? How? Um, okay. But as far as the game goes, what I will say is in looking at the landscape of college football, game ones are weird. They're really, really weird because you spend all of camp focused on this first part of the season. And I say first part, and that make more sense in a second. But you don't play anyone. You don't have any preseason games to get ready for. In high school football, you do scrimmages with schools in your area, right? Um, sometimes you can go to like a jamboree where you scrimmage like three schools. You play like a quarter against each or something. Like you get ready to play, right? In NFL football, they have preseason football games. And does everybody, you know, the starters might play a series, but people get to play. They go through the routine. They go out there and hit, and they have some live film to watch, Right, they practice against one another, and that's frankly more high speed for the starters than you might see in a preseason game. Right, um, they get to play other people before it starts. In college football, you got yourselves, and that's it. And you can go ones versus ones, and you got a hundred man roster, you know, eighty five scholarships or whatever. Like, I guess theoretically, you can find a way to do that better. But also in college football, you're only seeing yourselves, and so when you go out and see someone else for the first time, weird. Things happen. Like, I don't know that Florida is going to be any good this year, but they got embarrassed on national television. 20, they, I lost 24 to 11, but it was worse than that over the course of the game if you were paying it, right? Um, the first night of college football, I guess it was Thursday night of week one, right? Um, if you keep looking across the scoreboards, um, I think the impactful things are actually somewhat mostly in the Big 12, but like Georgia Tech losing to Louisville was an interesting result, or at least I thought it was an interesting result. Um, when you get down to it, like West Virginia and what's supposed to be somewhat of a rival game in Penn State got the doors blown off of them. Texas had trouble with Rice in the first half, had trouble blocking them. Texas offensive line looked very vulnerable for what it's worth up the middle in that football game. Um, and like, are some of those things like looking ahead, right? Is, is West Virginia focused more on Pitt this year than Penn State? Maybe. Is Texas focused more on their week two matchup with Alabama than Rice? Maybe, but at the end of the day, you see those kinds of things. I mean, college kids making mistakes in week one is very, very normal. And that's before you, before you even get to like TCU coming off of the getting embarrassed defensively in the national championship game, gives up 45 points to a bunch of kids playing their first game together at Colorado under coach Deion Sanders. Yikes. Like, I don't mean to take away from Prime and Shador and like I want Travis Hunter on the Texans and all those kinds of things, right? Um, but those guys just started playing together 
and TCU get, let him get 45. Shador Sanders set a school passing record in his first game at the school against TCU, right? That that's not good, folks. That's not good. Um, some of the some of the stuff did look really good, right? Like Oklahoma scored 73 in Arkansas State. They're supposed to blow the doors off Arkansas State. Oregon scored 81 points against Portland State. I didn't know Portland State had a football team good to Oregon, right? Those kinds of things happen. But you also had things that aren't supposed to happen happen. Like our fellow Big 12 brethren, Texas Tech going up to Wyoming and losing in overtime, right? And frankly, felt kind of lucky to get there, right? Um, at, you know, without having watched much of that game because of Houston being in the same, also on Saturday night, that's embarrassing, right? Baylor losing to Texas State, that's embarrassing. Right. And now the funny thing there is like, you know, whatever t- Ted Cruz has gone to a t- uh, state of Texas sporting event, whether it's the Rockets in 2018 or various college football teams around the country or whatever, um, there seemed to be some bad luck there. And there were pictures of him there in Waco at the Baylor game. And so they lose and it adds to the bad luck of having Cruz at the game, or whatever. But, um, but Baylor's in Texas State's embarrassing for the conference, for Waco, for all of us. Now I enjoy laughing at Waco and, and Baylor and that kind of stuff, but that was an embarrassing result. And I have to say, that when you look at it, Houston, I maintain, played a good group of five team. Now, they didn't play Alabama, right? They didn't play Georgia, but they played a good group of five team. Like, if you told me in three or four months that UTSA was competing to win the American Athletic Conference, I'd believe you. That's not a crazy result at all. And Houston played them and won, and won a complex defensive game where both teams were trying to find ways to scrap together plays to put together to win. They won, despite losing, as I mentioned, a very important part of their defense. They won with a quarterback in his first game in a new system. They won with an offensive coordinator, or at least the person calling plays. I shouldn't say offensive coordinator, but the person calling plays. And his first time calling plays in at least a while. He had, I guess, called some plays in his time at Fordham briefly. But before that, it always worked for Dana while Dana called the plays at West Virginia. And that's Coach Mike Burchette. I look at this and I see like, you know, Houston could have looked a lot better, but BYU only beat Sam Houston State 14 to nothing, right? Houston could have looked a lot better, but UCLA only beat Coastal Carolina 27 to 13, right? Houston could have looked a lot better, sure. But they also could have done a lot worse. Week ones in college football are decisively weird. College football is decisively weird. And sometimes it's nice to just know that the weird went our way, even if it was still a little weird. If you disagree or if you want to tell me I'm wrong, if you want to tell me that I'm being way too happy, I think people tell me I'm too optimistic all the time about this football team, and I disagree. You can find me at Painsworth512, P-A-I-N-S-W-O-R-T-H-512 on all of your favorite social media handles. We have to talk all things Houston Cougars. The Astros make a little bit of a run here. Uh, you know, Rockets are, I, I'm a big Rockets guy. Uh, the Texans kick off the weekend. Whatever you talk about Houston sports, I'm ready to talk about it at Painsworth512 on all of the things you do social media on. Thank you all so much for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day today. For a second listen, I'm going to recommend Locked on Big 12 because some of those losses we talked about take a couple of days for our buddy Drake to get over. So make sure you go follow him over there and listen to that show next for a good laugh, a good cry, or something in the middle. Thank you all so much for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. Locked on Cougs, the private Locked on Podcast Network, and that means your team every day. Go Cougs.